So today I, I want to talk about, um, you know, the title of my presentation originally was uh, making as a transformative way for education. And then I, I added a question mark at the end because that's a little bit um, what I want to talk about. I want to talk about this question mark, if making actually is a transformative way for education or, or not. And I, you soon understand more of what I mean. Um, so I wanted to start talking about something that, you know, of course, many of you have thought about this or are familiar with this, but so how do it, education systems get built? Right. Uh, we are, uh, you know, education. We have been doing education for centuries and there is a sort of a, a, a script to how they, they get built. So, you know, often we start by societal needs and also by the societal ethos. So, you know, what do we care about? What do we want kids to learn about? And also the needs, like we want people to do you know, to write or to do math or to learn how to um, do agriculture or, you know, all kinds of things. So over centuries, we, we have done this. We start from the societal needs. And more, you know, recently in the last 100 years, we also transformed that into national standards. Then those national, those national standards are transformed into lesson plans and books. Then we train teachers and finally gets to, to the classroom. And the, the reason I'm showing this is that, you know, every time we talk about systemic change and changing the system and everything, you know, and now, you know, this became like a cliche that people are like, oh, we need to change the system. The system is bad, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to remember that when we talk about changing the system, we're talking about changing all of those parts of the system, which is a gigantic task. And, and I'll, I'll talk more about uh, about this in the, in, the, in the next month. But let's go back like 500 years and talk about the societal needs that originated the system, most of the system we have today. So this, uh, some of you might know, uh, is a very old textbook, actually the first modern math textbook. And you can see, you know, here the, the multiplication table, the algorithms for division, for multiplication, and, and all this, this stuff that you might have learned in school. And this, as you might know, is the, the Treviso, Treviso arithmetic from 1478. Uh, so, you know, to me, when I found this book, and actually there was a copy uh, in, in, in the Columbia Library, it, it's quite shocking to see that those algorithms are 500 years old, you know, and that we're still teaching them as if nothing had cha has changed in, in our lives, in the technologies that we have and all of that. But I think to me, you know, another shocking thing is that this textbook, which was, um, came about in, you know, Venice when people had to do a lot of math because there was a lot of commerce, there was a lot of entrepreneurship, you know, this kind of nascent capitalist society. So they needed to do, you know, problems of partnership, barter, and, uh, you know, all, all kinds of uh, financial calculations and all of that. But, you know, if, even more shocking than the algorithms is that the problems that were in, those, in, the, in that book were, it, it's strikingly similar to what we have today. So this is one of the problems in the Treasury Arithmetic 550 years ago that a carpenter, you know, undertake to undertook to build a house in 20 days then he takes another man if we build a house together we can accomplish in eight days so this is like you maybe the, there is a very similar problem in in a standardized test in some european or israeli country or israeli test um, or, or u.s test you know this is a very common test it's like you do something in a given time you partner with someone how much time do you so uh, those kinds of problems, of course, were, you know, very important back then because people were actually building houses with friends or colleagues or whatever. So calculating those kinds of word problems, were, that, that was not just a word problem. It was a real problem that people had. And, you know, this got solidified in our national standards and books and in our imaginary in, a, in a, such a powerful way that even now that this is a you know mostly hypothetical problem or more 
you know, we, we're still doing those kinds of things. We're still doing those kinds of problems, even though a lot of them have no application anymore, or even though a lot of this kinds of stuff uh, can be done by our phones and, and all that. So anyways, so th this is just to, you know, talk about this societal needs. So what we have right now was born in a very different world where, you know, people need to do all these things in their heads. They needed to uh, do these actual real problems of partnership percentage, uh, you know, and, and all of that. But now we have a very different situation, right? So we know that you might know this graph, like tasks in the US economy, everything that's routine is being, routine tasks are, you know, systematically re replaced by um, computers and now by artificial intelligence. And so all of those tasks are going down. Those jobs are disappearing, obviously, as you know. And then everything that's unscripted, that's complex, that's unstructured, all of those jobs are you know, still here with us because computers cannot do that and even AI cannot do that for the most part. So you know, when um, governments and policymakers started to realize this, they realized that, okay, this stuff that these progressive educators have been talking for like 50 years, that's not just a pipe dream, it's an actual uh, reality. We actually need to change what we're teaching in schools because uh, you know, those skills, the, the content is not that important anymore. Uh, a lot of the operations we're teaching, kids can do in you know, their computers and all of that, and especially, the, the economy, or the economies that will thrive in the 21st century, as we know, uh, are economies that will be, uh, you know, prepared to invent, to create new things and all of that, and not to do kind of, you know, fractions and, and basic math. And all of that. However, a lot of this concern, in a way, has been translated not into very progressive kind of things, but into things like this. Uh, so every, every other day I bump into a piece of news saying Silicon Valley company invents AI teacher to you know, teach kids math or science or whatever. And you know, when I go into the, the historical record and I do a lot of research on like old books and magazines, this is uh, from the 1950s. And this is a magazine article saying that you know, people had uh, come up with a robot uh, machine, some kind of electromechanical robot that could teach kids. And it was mostly like a sort of a, a box that could do question and answer. So, you know, we have an, an early version of the box there uh, on, on the right, but uh, then they invented versions with like screens and, and a sort of a glorified slide projector that would project questions and then students would answer and then they could check the answers and all of that. So, and this kind of solution for education is, as I said, still here with us. Uh, you know, every other day there is some kind of AI company saying we're going to uh, replace teachers with AI. AI is going to change everything. Uh, you know, we're going to change education by employing, uh, you know, apps, algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. We're going to do personalized education and all of that. But when you look at, you know, and, and we can talk like a, for hours about this whole thing, but I'll summarize in a few sentences. There is an entire group of solutions and an entire group of companies and scholars and um, uh, policy making solutions that's dedicated to take the system exactly as it is. So the content that we have, the math that we have from 500 years ago, the science that we have from 50 years ago, package that into apps and websites and AI agent, whatever, and sell this as personalized, customized, student-centered learning. In fact, what they do is just to allow students to go a little bit faster or a little bit slower. Students cannot choose if they want to learn something, if they want to learn something else, or if they want to, uh, you know, bring something from their lives or whatever. It's the exact same content 
packaged in a modern kind of AI, Silicon Valley-ish kind of way, but it's doing exactly the same. It's not changing any of those boxes that I showed before, like the system, the textbooks and all of that. It's just a kind of status quo. It's more of the same, but package in a modern way. And, and this is something that I think we you know, should be aware of and we should uh, denounce and also especially say, what's, what is the alternative to that, to this kind of AI powered traditional education? So I think the answer to that, which I think re relates a lot to what we want to do in, in this grant is that what we want from new technologies is not to package, repackage the old stuff with you know, a, modern, a modern take or with AI or whatever. But I think it's to help ch children learn unimaginable things. Uh, so you know, just a few years ago, I was at the, the, the WAG uh, Institute uh, and I, I, I attended like a biomaking workshop, right? So where they were doing all kinds of growing organisms and, and now kids can do PCR, you know, this kind of ge uh, ge genetic sequencing and all of that. That's a great example of technologies making things, unimaginable things possible. How, you know, when growing up, like when would you imagine that kids would be doing genetic sequencing in, 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 a, in a bio lab or, or or in, in, a, in a fab lab or in a, in a maker space. And that's the kind of thing that I think is exciting for science learning. So, you know, think about genomics, but also biochemistry, bioengineering, machine learning, AI, space science, all, all of those things are uh, things that, you know, would be impossible to teach 10 years ago or even five years ago. But because technologies are cheaper and because we are designing lots of different kinds of things like new ways for kids to program computers, new ways for kids to do machine learning, new ways to do you know, biomaking uh, and, and all, all those kinds of things. Now we can teach 21st century content in the 21st century schools. And I think that's the really uh, exciting thing. So, but the interesting thing is that all of those things that I mentioned, they are not stuff you just teach in the traditional way, but you have to really build and make and, and, and learn it in a hands-on kind of way. So it's not by teaching, but by constructing, right? Think about all of those things. You cannot just do bioengineering by you know, lecturing, or you cannot learn artificial intelligence or machine learning or, or, or any of those things by just attending a lecture. You have to actually, you know, go into a lab, build things and all of that. And I think that's a great opportunity because we have an opportunity to get all of this old system that we have and revisit the system and say, okay, what is the societal need that we have now? What, what is the ethos that we have now? And so instead of national standards that are fixed in that last 50 years, we should have evolving and flexible national standards that change every few years with the new you know, societal needs and ethos that we have. Instead of like lesson plans and books that last for like 20 years, we should have more things that we are going to design in this grant, like kits, new kinds of spaces, activities, guidelines, things that are more flexible, that are not uh, fossilized in a, in a library or, or in a textbook. We should change, of course, professional development. And our classroom should not be a, a classroom, it should be classrooms. So we should have classrooms everywhere. You know, those kits, those spaces, those activities, they should be usable in a multi, a multiple, uh, multiple spaces. And now, you know, with the pandemic and all the other uh, environmental crises that we might have in the future, we should be even more aware that disruptions to school might happen more often. So those kits and those spaces should be not just the classroom, but it should be at home. It should be in the library, in the maker space, in the community center and, and all of that. So I think this is the kind of system that we want to build. And as you, as you can realize, it's a huge project, but I think it, it takes understanding all the components of the system to, for us to start thinking about all the work we have to do to effectively 
change the system. So it's not just saying, oh, I will do, you know, a few workshops, whatever. We have to change national standards. Otherwise, we will not change the system. We have to change, you know, the, the very idea of a textbook has to change and, and all of those things. So where are we with maker and constructionist learning? And why I think this is a great starting point for this uh, systemic change. First of all, we have thousands of maker, lab all, maker labs all around the world, which is uh, quite an amazing thing because what was the last time that schools invented a new space for learning, right? Maybe like 50 years ago, the, the art room or the library or the, the gym, but it's been many decades since we invented and implemented a new space in schools. And I think that's, that's an amazing thing. Another amazing thing is that Things like computer science, I'm sorry for the siren, but things like computer science are now mandatory in many schools in, for millions of kids in the UK, in many states in the US. Let's just wait two seconds. In many spaces, in, in many uh, states in the US, in many other countries. And that's just five years ago, this would be a, an impossibility. We have a new type of teacher in many countries. There is this new type of teacher, the maker teacher, which is the person who manages and teaches in the maker space, which again is a once in a generation thing. What was the last time we had a new type of teacher that's not the math teacher, not the science teacher, the maker teacher in the schools. And we have policymakers on board, like we have you know, whole countries or states uh, doing huge maker education projects in, in different countries and in different parts of the world. So all of those four things are, are quite amazing and they are once in a generation kind of things. And those are all parts of building this new system. As you can see, you can map a lot of those four things I mentioned to, you know, those, those five things. So I think that's a great starting point, but I want to end with, um, a sort of a cautionary tale or a little bit you know, something we have to worry about uh, even though we have something great going on but the problem is it's not really just about making it's all it's mainly about learning and i think this is um, you know one of the main problems that i see today in maker education and in maker spaces and all of that is that uh, people think that if kids are making stuff, they're learning. And we know from research that that's not true. So it's very easy to be impressed by like cute projects and, and great like, you know, project expos and great stories about kids making, making projects, make, making things and all of that. But we have done extensive research on this. And, you know, in my lab, we have shown that many times kids are making stuff, they're building interesting things and all of that. But if you're not facilitating it, if you're not structured the work in a certain way, they might not, they might not be learning much because learning is not just about making. Like, you know, I, I, I always use the example that you can cook the same dish a hundred times uh, and, and not learn anything. You can just go on automatic. You can just kind of go through the motions. So learning requires a very kind of explicit and, and, uh, an intentional uh, stance. And that's something that many maker spaces, many, a lot of work in maker education is missing. So trivial maker education will not do. So just, you know, this trivial projects in making trivial maker education might actually set us back because people will say, okay, kids are learning, you have all these maker spaces, but then when you look at what kids are learning, they might not be learning much because we're not, paying attention to that. We're not structuring the work to make them reflect on what they're doing, to make their, you know, as Edith Ackerman says, to, to make them work hands-on and heads in. So I think um, this is a really important uh, uh, aspect of making that we have to pay attention to. So, you know, I think the relevance for this to our grant is that uh, we need to pay attention not just to the hands-on, but we need to think about is the kind of hands-on that we are eliciting, is it also uh, uh, getting kids to learn about the content that we care about? Because it's very easy to get seduced by um, nice projects, kids, ha you know, happy kids in a makerspace, but 
sometimes they, they are not actually learned. So uh, I just want to end saying that, you know, what's really hard is moving from uh, the, the kind of the easy part of this project of changing education to systemic change. And that means really the hard things like national exams, how we manage college admission, changing national curriculum. And if we don't do that, and I think we have a great contribution for this, if we don't do that, our kind of work will always be at the margins of a system and will always be kind of complementary to a system, but never actually changing the system because those are the, the, the pillars of the system that we had to, to change. And I think, you know, we, I hope this, our work is a contribution to build a new system. And this system, you know, requires all of this, this, this boxes to be addressed. So different national standards, different materials, different professional development and all of that. And I think we have a great contribution and a great chance to do it across many different countries, many different cultures. And that's uh, one of the reasons I'm very excited to be part of this group. So, obrigado. Thank you, Paulo, for the presentation. Uh, we're a little bit late, right, on our agenda. So, Maria, take us now. Yeah, I think uh, if uh, we have maybe a couple of uh, minutes, well, we are late, but I, I was really, I really liked Paolo, your presentation. I think it's very inspirational. So, if anybody would like to share any, any comments or questions, uh, please feel free. I like very much the slogan that you put us, like hands on mind, heads in. I remember uh, our dearest friend, uh, Jorge Wagensberg, who died a few years ago. For those who are from the science centers and science museum community who probably remember, he always, always said like hands on minds on. And, 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 and also there was a, 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 some some idea, but we didn't really take it enough seriously, I guess, with the Science Center and Science Museum as we were too, ma too much busy with the hands-on. And I think what you offer us here as a kind of deep change is, is, is very important for us to bring something new to the community of MAKE. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanna... honestly, this hands-on mind in is from uh, Edith Ackerman. Uh, ah, it's from Edith? Okay. okay. Uh, so it's not mine, but I okay. really like we'll it. We'll give her credit. She's a yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of... Um, Maria, can I speak? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm sort of wondering about what you said about the systemic change, because... There is a lot of knowledge that is classical knowledge that science is built on. And we're talking about something that's going, that we want to change everything. But where, what, where do we put all the classical knowledge? I mean, you were talking about arithmetic, for instance. But even if you talk about genetic sequencing, or if we're talking about the COVID and molecular biology, this is a whole set of details that that's built on so much knowledge. And um, I'm wondering where it all fits in this system because um, that's what I'm wondering. So if you're talking about systemic change, where is this classical knowledge going uh, to? Where, did, where will it come from? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that's a great question. And, and I think that's, that might be even the most important question uh, we have to address. Because everywhere I go, I talk to, you know, secretaries of education and all of that. Everybody wants to add like 21st century skills, all kinds of new skills, new content, new things. And then, you know, I ask, but what are you prepared to give up, right? And they say, well, nothing. I, I can't because this is all, you know, the, the foundation of stuff. This is, you know. And, and I think there is, 
it is true. There is a lot of foundational knowledge, right? You're not going to understand, um, you know, advanced math if you don't know basic arithmetic and all of that. So there is truth to that. But I think, you know, this kind of choice will, will never be easy. It's not uh, that we're going to say, oh, arithmetic is useless. So let's drop it. I think it will be a very hard choice, but it will be more about what we prioritize as a society, right? So um, I think that's, you know, one part of it. So it, it's a really hard choice, but it's like, it's great that people can write beautifully and they can, you know, have good handwriting and all of that. But it's not that important anymore, right? So it, it's probably great that people can calculate things quickly in their, in their heads or they can calculate like the tip in a restaurant or whatever. So it's important, but maybe not as important as other things. So I think that's one part of it. The, the other part is that I think we'll have to do some very smart redesigning of uh, curricula and standards and all of that to find ways to teach the, the parts that we really want to keep you know, of math or science and all this foundational knowledge, but in a way that's, uh, it's a, it's more, it's faster and it's more connected to uh, things that people really uh, need to know. For, so for example, you know, some people are saying instead of spending so many, this many years on algebra, or uh, we should split that time between algebra and statistics, right? Because statistics is now more important or as important as algebra. So we should find ways to teach algebra, you know, whatever is needed of that, but faster or, or the, the important section of that. And the, the rest of the time we should dedicate to statistics because, you know, people really need to know that. And I think, you know, this, this requires a lot of work because it requires really going back to the topic by topic and, and saying, do we really need this? And, and we don't. So I think one example from Steamer Papert, you know, he, he has this famous example of division of fractions, right? That the only reason we learn division of fractions is because mathematicians, they like to teach the entire system, right? So if you're teaching fractions, you're teaching addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. If you tell a mathematician, no, division of fractions is useless because, you know, it, in practice, you don't really use it much. They say, no, this is the whole system, you know. So I, I think a lot of things in math and science are professional scientists saying, we have to teach the entire system so that people understand, you know, this whole body of knowledge. But I think some parts of that system are not as important as, you know, others. So I think that's another way of addressing this is, looking at math and science and looking at what we what the kinds of things we're teaching just because we want to sh you know to sample uh, uh, the whole system and what parts are really important